Good afternoon. In part one of today's Angry Double Play, we're going to be talking about Mobile Launch Tower 2 and why this has become the latest disaster in the whole Artemis fiasco. Why do we need another launch tower? I mean, didn't we just complete one for Artemis 1? Why do we need a second so quickly? And also, haven't we learned how to build them properly? Well, obviously not, because as you're going to see, not only has the price tag accelerated tremendously for this new launch tower, it's also delayed so much that we can't expect the Artemis 4 mission to happen until at least 2029. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon, and once again, welcome to part one of an angry double play today where we're going to be talking about NASA moon missions, neither of which really have a happy ending, but this one is especially bad, and that is the fate of Mobile Launch Tower 2, or ML2, and why it's so significantly delayed and why it's so expensive. But first of all, why is it even necessary? The tower that was originally intended to launch the Ares rocket after lots of modifications and an enormous amount of expense, and by the way, being handed from contractor to contractor to contractor was eventually completed for Artemis 1, and it will handle Artemis 2 and 3, and then that's it. That's the end for that tower, which by the way, we don't even have a unified engineering design for. Nobody who worked on that tower worked on it from beginning to end, which means nobody thoroughly understands how ML1 works. So I suppose that's a pretty good reason to switch. But here's the other reason what you're looking at right now. The Exploration Upper Stage, a 4RL10 engine upper stage designed to take a lot more payload out to the moon and other destinations throughout the solar system that the current SLS cannot do because it has only one RL-10 engine on the ICPS or interim cryogenic propulsion stage, the key word being interim. So we need another launch tower to accommodate a bigger rocket. So here's the differences. First of all, you have the actual access arm and egress systems, nothing's really changed about that except for the location. Has to be further up because the Block 1B SLS is a taller rocket. You also have something called a vehicle damper system. This is a new modification and they put it in here to provide additional stabilization for the bigger rocket, especially in the event of high winds. Then you have upper stage umbilicals, not only do these have to be located in a different place, but they also have to be capable of pumping a lot more propellant because the exploration upper stage carries a lot more liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen than the old ICPS did. You also have a reinforced vehicle stabilizer. Indeed, the entire tower is designed to support a heavier rocket than the original ML-1. Keep in mind, ML-1 wasn't even designed for something near as big as SLS. It was designed for the much smaller Ares rocket and was essentially beefed up to accommodate the SLS and just isn't the right mobile launch tower for the job. And then finally, we have the tower and base that also has been beefed up to handle higher structural loads. So the tower itself is going to be about two meters taller and about three meters wider than the original tower. And so to avoid the pit falls experienced by the first mobile launch tower, NASA awarded this contract to a single contractor who would handle the entire project from beginning to end. Imagine that. You would think it would go a lot better because of that, and yet it hasn't. First of all, NASA awarded a cost plus award fee contract to a company called Bechtel in order to design, build, and test this thing, and the initial contract was valued at 300 
$183 million. I think all of us can guess that it wasn't going to be anywhere close to that. And the performance period, by the way, was from July of 2019 to March of 2023. So this thing, theoretically, was supposed to be finished over a year ago, and we're nowhere close right now. Due to an aggressive launch schedule for Artemis 4 and using lessons learned from the first launch tower, which experienced contractor performance issues, cost increases, and schedule delays, the agency decided to use a design-build approach and award a single contract for both project design and construction. Great idea, at least in theory, didn't quite work out. So NASA evaluates Bechtel's contract performance on an ongoing basis and develops a formal award fee performance evaluation report every six months to determine the award fee score and the amount of award fee the contractor will receive. Why are they getting awards? Well, I don't know if I can really answer that question, but the initial contract included eight award fee or evaluation periods with a total of $23.3 million available in the award fee pool. To accommodate the contract's extended period of performance, NASA added six more award fee periods for a total of 14. And so the long and the short of it is, Bechtel has been awarded nearly 11 $11.2 million in bonuses for the approximately $715.5 million worth of work that they've done. Keep in mind, that's almost double the amount of money that they were contracted to build the entire tower for, but they're still getting bonuses for some reason. But regardless of any of that, what really is happening here? What has the Office of Inspector General discovered? Well, well, first of all, ML2 is going to cost over three times more than planned and will not be completed in time to meet the current Artemis 4 schedule. Let's get the details of that wonderful news. In 2019, NASA estimated the entire ML2 project from design through construction would cost under $500 million with construction completed and ML2 delivered to NASA by March of 2023, as we've already said. However, by August of 2022, two years ago, the contract value had already shot up to over a billion dollars. And by December of 2023, NASA estimated the ML2 project's total cost would reach nearly $1.5 billion, including $1.3 billion for the Bechtel contract and $168 million more for other project costs. So in June of 2024, five Five years after the contract was awarded, NASA established what is called the ABC, the Cost and Schedule Baseline Committed to Congress and the Office of Management and Budget against which a project is measured. The ABC identified a project cost of $1.8 billion, which includes Bechtel's costs, as well as other project costs for ML2 activities outside of the contract, and a delivery date from Bechtel to NASA of September of 2027. Keep in mind, that's over four years late. And according to the Office of Inspector General, it's going to get worse than that. But we'll get there. Despite the establishment of the ABC, NASA intends to keep Bechtel accountable to the cost and schedule agreed to in December of 2023. That is to say, the $1.3 billion in November of 2026 launcher delivery. So now that NASA has established an ABC for the project, ML2 project management is required to notify the NASA administrator if there is reasonable cause to believe that the ABC threshold is likely to be exceeded. So how exactly are they supposed to hold Bechtel accountable for any of this? Well, we'll see here. But in the meantime, in case you haven't heard enough bad news, well, here's some more bad news for you. As part of the agency's preparation for establishing this ABC, a NASA independent review team updated the program's joint cost and schedule confidence level, also known as the JCL, a risk-based estimate of cost and schedule to help predict the likelihood that a program or project will achieve its objectives within budget and on time. 
this independent review team made several adjustments to the JCL to reflect less optimistic assumptions. Estimating the ML2 project costs at $2.1 billion with a delivery of the launcher to NASA by January of 2028. While the independent review team noted the project has made significant recent progress, they also stated that the current ML2 budget and schedule are insufficient to meet NASA's project goals. In fact, the JCLs performed by this program and the independent review team both found a 0% likelihood of Bechtel delivering the launcher by November of 2026. How can you possibly award bonuses to a company that has a 0% chance of delivering the product that they were contracted to deliver by three years after the date they were supposed to deliver it? Actually, more than three years because it was supposed to be March of 2023. Instead, there's no chance at all that it's going to be delivered by November of 2026. And oh, is that not enough bad news for you? Well, I've got some more. Despite the agency's increased cost projections, our analysis, that is to say the OIG, indicates that ML2's cost could be even higher. In particular, if current cost growth trends continue, we project that ML2's project cost through the delivery of the launcher to NASA could climb to $2.7 billion, nearly a billion dollars more than the agency's ABC, which by the way was substantially higher than the original contract. This includes $2.5 billion for the Bechtel contract. Originally, it was less than $400 million. This isn't cost plus. This is cost plus, 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 plus. Now, unsurprisingly, NASA officials disagree with this analysis and they expect cost growth to lessen over time now that Bechtel has started construction of the launcher. The agency believes that this is an area of expertise for the contractor. So the assumption is that designing the launcher and doing everything up to this point, that is not an area of expertise? And why did they get that part of the job? So in any event, the OIG says the following, quote, while progress has been made with the beginning of the construction of ML2, in our judgment, it is too early to determine the impact on the contract's continued cost growth and whether Bechtel can achieve and sustain imp improved level of performance throughout the construction phase. Although a reduction in some estimated costs may eventually occur, we believe that Bechtel has yet to demonstrate the sustained level of performance needed to reduce overall costs and improve the project's timeline for completion and to make matters even worse along with significantly increased costs we project the ML2 will not be ready by the September 2028 Artemis 4 launch date. Remember, Bechtel's estimated date to deliver the ML2 to NASA is November of 2026, which by the way, they have a 0% chance of actually accomplishing, even though it's more than three and a half years after the original March 2023 delivery date. But following the handover, NASA will need 12 to 14 months to complete a test process to ensure that ML2 works as intended. And after this is completed, NASA estimates needing an additional seven months to perform launch operations, which includes placing the SLS Orion system on the ML2 and transporting it to the launch pad. Considering these time frames, the ML2 would not be ready until late summer 2028. This assumes, of course, that they actually deliver the launch tower by November of 2026, which isn't going to happen. So the OIG projects that ML2 will not be delivered to NASA until August of 2027, adding the additional time that NASA requires after delivery to prepare the launcher. It's not going to be ready for Artemis 4 until spring of 2029. 
And just in case you're not quite annoyed enough about this whole thing, let's go ahead and find out what sorts of awards Bechtel has received for their performance. Oh yeah, and the performance scores that they got during a great portion of this time period. From July to September of 2019, they got a very good performance rating and $790,000 worth of an award given out of 987000 maximum. So almost all of it, really. And then at period two, October 2019 to March 2020, another very good score, over a million dollars awarded. And then period three, April 2020 to September of 2020, another very good performance rating, over $3.4 million awarded in bonuses. Then for period four, October 2020 to March of 2021, Finally, NASA managed to put their glasses on a bit and gave them an unsatisfactory rating with no award given. Then period 5, April 2021 to September of 2021, another good rating, another $2.9 million awarded. But then period 6 and period 7, going from October 2021 to September of 2022, unsatisfactory ratings and no no awards given. Did NASA finally figure out what sorts of awards they should really be giving for incompetent performance? Well, no, because in period 8, October 2022 to March of 2023, over $1.2 million in bonuses were awarded and a good score given followed at period 9, April 2023 to September of 2023, another good score and over $1.7 million dollars awarded. So up to September of 2023, and by the way, this is already significantly after the tower should have already been delivered. Bechtel had been assessed with an overall rating of good, a bit above average, and an award of over $11.1 million in bonuses. And in a masterstroke of understatement, the OIG had this to say about this whole situation. Quote, We question these award fees based on remarks in award fee performance evaluation reports from March and September of 2023, indicating that Bechtel was still not meeting its baseline cost and schedule goals. Specifically, the award fee justification documentation noted several critical weaknesses during those periods. Now, Number one, the provision of substandard or unclear engineering designs to its steel fabricators. Number two, a failure to accelerate the construction critical path needed for Bechtel to meet NASA's contract need date of May of 2026, and instead adding three months of potentially unrecoverable schedule slip. Number three, a failure to meet 90% of design comment incorporation goals with some slipping seven months past the baseline target, risking further delays to fabrication activities. Number four, an inefficient and expensive corporate process for implementing engineering charges to over $400 million worth of ground support equipment fabrication. And finally, number five, the completion of only 11 of 30 steel deliveries required to maintain the project's critical path, several of which were out of sequence or otherwise not ready for installation. And keep in mind, for these two award periods, award, uh, periods eight and nine, that is, NASA awarded Bechtel a rating of, quote, good, unquote, with a corresponding bonus of nearly $3 million. Now, the Office of Inspector General doesn't say this, but I certainly will. I can't point out a better example of government contractor corruption than this. How in the world can this company have been awarded millions of dollars in bonuses while having all of these incredible shortfalls during this performance period? It makes no sense. The only thing that does make sense is corruption. Now, what does the OIG suggest that NASA do about this? What sort of changes do they recommend to be implemented? 
Well, surprisingly, almost nothing. Although, when it comes right down to it, if you think about it for a while, there really are no significant changes that can be implemented this late in the process. For example, they talked about the possibility of converting to a fixed price contract, but it was estimated that whatever price Bechtel would give for a fixed price contract would be so high that NASA could never fit it into their budget, simply because Bechtel has handled so much of the this process that they could essentially demand whatever fixed cost they want, taking into account whatever unforeseen circumstances may come up in the future of this project, which obviously has escalated prices a lot as it is, and also the amount of time that it would take to evaluate and negotiate a fixed price contract. That alone would take 9 to 12 months, delaying the project even more. This late in the project Project. The only thing the OIG can recommend is that NASA learn from all the mistakes that were made in the performance of this contract, especially in regards to cost plus contracts. It just doesn't seem that this is the way to do these sorts of things with NASA simply because contractors find it very, very easy to take advantage of the conditions of contracts like this only to gut the taxpayer later on. But there are drawbacks to fixed price contracts as well. It's very, very difficult to assess what an ambitious project like this is really going to cost. And so if you are putting forward a fixed price bid, you're going to have to bid high in order to account for any sort of unforeseen events that may happen later on in the project. And if you do that, only companies that have billionaire founders like Blue Origin, SpaceX, and the like are going to be able to provide the low bids because if it turns out that the contract is substantially more expensive than was originally thought, a billionaire can just go ahead and pay for the difference. This will eventually allow billionaire-led companies to completely dominate the industry. Hell, we're nearly there already to where they're the only ones who start getting these contracts. And once we're down to that point, once the competition has been crushed so thoroughly, I'll tell you, billionaires are not going to be lowballing their contracts anymore. Not unless they have to, which complicates this matter even further. I'm not saying that that means cost plus is the way we need to go. I'm simply saying that it's a complex issue and perhaps the biggest thing that needs to be eliminated from government contracts. And this has been the case for as long as there's been a government to have a relationship with contractors is simply blatant corruption. And I don't see how corruption could be get any more obvious than what we're seeing with Mobile Launch Tower 2. And there needs to be a process to hold people accountable when things go this wrong. That, perhaps more than fixed price contracts, is a better solution, in my opinion, to have a better space agency going forward. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe. And I would like to thank new Patreon members Mike Harner and Nick B. Thanks to your help and the help of other folks on PayPal and Patreon, I have been able to purchase my ticket for Cape Canaveral. Thank you so much for that. Of course, still have hotel, rental car, that sort of thing that I could use support with. So all the details in the description if you'd like to become a part of that. But once again, without your help, I simply wouldn't be able to do these things at all. So thank you so much. And again, thanks everybody for watching. And as always, stay angry about space.